The subject of our talk today is the magnificent painting behind me. Charles I and Henrietta Maria, with their two eldest children, Prince Charles, later King Charles II, and Princess Mary, a composition better known as the Great Peace. This particular painting was described in 2004 by the Van Dyck scholar, the late Sir Oliver Miller, surveyor of Her Majesty the Queen's pictures, as an important copy after the painting by Van Dyck, now hanging at Windsor Castle. But research done by a Chelsea pensioner over 100 years ago, re-revealed today, suggested that the Chelsea painting might in fact be Van Dyck's original rather than a copy. So the title of our talk is The Royal Hospital Great Peace, Van Dyck or Not Van Dyck. Our project, the International Jordaans Van Dyck Panel Paintings Project, based from the Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Brussels, is systematically studying the oil paintings on oak panel of the Flemish masters Anthony van Dyck and Jacques Jordaens, two of the triumvirate of the great 17th century Antwerp painters, the third being Peter Paul Rubens, for whom both Jordaens and van Dyck worked when they were young men. Anthony van Dyck was born in Antwerp in 1599, but he is, of course, most closely associated with the doomed court of Charles I. From Van Dyck's second stay in London, from 1632, until his death in Blackfriars in 1641. A child prodigy and a genius, he is perhaps the greatest portrait painter that has ever lived. When Thomas Gainsborough died in 1778, his last words were reportedly, we are all going to heaven and Van Dyck is of the party. With the exception of two small black and white sketches, one of which we'll discuss later, Van Dyck painted on oak panels only whilst he was living on the continent. These were mainly religious subjects and some portraits, large and small. They included a number of apostles who were a very popular subject in Counter-Reformation Antwerp. The brilliance of these apostle paintings is that they are in fact portraits of real people living in Antwerp at the time. And they demonstrate Van Dyck's brilliance as a portrait painter, evident even when he was a young man in his mid-teens. So popular are these paintings of apostles that they were seemingly endlessly copied by other artists. And to date, our project in the many countries we have visited have seen and examined an enormous amount of bearded apostles. So it's a great pleasure to be giving a talk today on something other than a bearded apostle. <laughs> as well as examining every panel painting that we can find by Jordaens and Van Dyck across the world, from Puerto Rico to St. Petersburg, dating the wood, matching the wood with other paintings, marking the names of the panel makers where their brands are evident on the back of the panel some 400 years after they were made. The project is also conducting new archival research across borders in Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom. Part of this research process includes revisiting primary sources and archives to hunt for new or previously overlooked clues and it also includes consulting the archives of distinguished deceased Van Dyck scholars. And it was on such a quest that James Innes Mulrain and I found ourselves in the Heinz Library and Archive at the National Portrait Gallery on a cold December morning in 2017. We were there to examine the Van Dyck archive of the late Sir Lionel Cust, a former director of the National Portrait Gallery and surveyor of the king's pictures. In 1900, Cust had written the first substantial English monograph on Van Dyck. Lionel Cust, born in 1859, joined the civil service after Eton and Cambridge. His first posting was to the War Office on Pall Mall, where his reputation as the top classical scholar of his year at Cambridge went unrecognized. 
Instead, he was appointed a clerk in the Department of the Financial Secretary, <laughs> Subdivision F3, where his duties were to record and examine the accounts of all the regimental paymasters in the British Army. Not unsurprisingly, Cust found this work uncongenial, <laughs> in his own words. Others record that he performed poorly. However, after two years of this misery, he was happily transferred to the print room of the British Museum. And in 1895, he was appointed director of the National Portrait Gallery, and simultaneously, in 1901, surveyor of the King's pictures and works of art. Unfortunately, from an art historian's point of view, his posthumously published memoir, Edward VII and His Court, has little to do with paintings. They only mention Van Dyck once, in passing, and they are more concerned with his time as a gentleman usher to King Edward VII, to which position he was also appointed in 1901. Whilst Van Dyck is only mentioned once, three pages are dedicated to the uniform of a gentleman usher. <laughs> and it is the gentleman usher's uniform that Cust is wearing in this splendid portrait by Sir John Lavery. Though we do learn from his memoirs that Queen Victoria's predilection for collecting white marble busts led to a nearly disastrous experiment after King Edward VII's succession to the throne in 1901. The king decided to disperse the busts of his late mother's collection around Windsor Castle, and some of them, including his father Prince Albert and the brothers and sons of King George III, were arranged around the walls of St George's Hall. When the busts were placed in the hall, the whiteness of the marble appeared incongruous against the dark wood panelling. It was suggested to Cust that the coldness of the white surfaces could be tempered with a solution of tea applied to the marble. This was done and for three days appeared to work well. On the fourth day, it was noticed that Prince Albert appeared to be sporting a chestnut-coloured toupee and that various Hanoverians were in danger of becoming similarly bewigged. <laughs> the solution of tea was rapidly scrubbed off. Cust's reputation as an art historian was formidable, and he authored a number of well-received monographs and catalogues. He was forthright. His obituary in The Spectator in 1929 noted that he was much bolder in attributing doubtful pictures to particular painters than one would have expected of a man with his training. His championship of an attribution when he found himself in a minority of one was often entertainingly vigorous. He lived in a glorious period of discoveries in country houses, many of which he made himself. A Turk by Tantoretto in the library at New Battle in Midlothian was actually a Rembrandt. And the exquisite miniature, The Execution of Mary Queen of Scots, in the collection of Earl Beecham at Madrasfield had been badly misidentified over the years. It was, in fact, Queen Elizabeth washing the feet of the poor on Maundy Thursday. <laughs> we had been looking in Cust's archive at the National Portrait Gallery for references to panel paintings. It was a great surprise when we found a remarkable correspondence between Sir Lionel and Corporal Charles Dias, an in-painter, I beg your pardon, an in-pensioner here at the Royal Hospital, Chelsea. Dias claimed, with good reason, in 1902, that the painting behind me was the original by Van Dyck and that the version in the Royal Collection was merely a copy. From thence sprung an unusual and extraordinary art historical collaboration between Cust and Dias. At first glance, the corporal and the courtier made an unlikely team. Dias, a Shropshire grocer, had enlisted in the first lifeguards in 1861 at the age of 20. His 19-year service spanned the period between the Crimean War and the Egyptian campaigns and was spent on ceremonial duty based at Windsor and at Regent's Park Barracks. In 1880, he was discharged as unfit. His eyesight damaged by rheumatic iritis, contracted from living under canvas. He became an out-pensioner of the Royal Hospital, 
on a pension of 11 pence per day. But he was still only 39, and he married a widow, Sarah Frockingham, a month after his discharge. He became a coffee house keeper and stepfather to her two daughters, living at Albany Street St Pancras, still close to Regent's Park Barracks. In the 1880s, they moved to Winchester, where Dias became landlord of the Plume of Feathers pub. On December 1st, 1896, by then a widower and without dependents, Charles Dias entered the Royal Hospital as an in-pensioner, living on Ward 22. Three things stood out about him. The first is that he stood six foot six in his boots and was popularly known at the Royal Hospital as the Giant. Second, that at a youthful 55, he was the youngest man of the hospital and therefore known as its baby. And thirdly, that he had no wish for an easy retirement. He promptly set about fighting for the Chelsea pensioners' right to vote and researching a history of the Royal Hospital. While researching in the Royal Hospital archives at the State Paper Office at Somerset House and in the House of Lords Library, he made several significant discoveries about the Great Peace. These led him to write a bold memorandum to the surveyor of the King's Pictures, Sir Lionel Cust, proposing that the version of the Great Peace hanging in this hospital was the original by Van Dyck, and that the version in the King's Collection, then hanging in the Van Dyck Room at Windsor Castle, was only a copy. The Great Peace is one of Van Dyck's most famous paintings, a seemingly effortless rendition of kingship. It suggests presence, power, and dynastic harmony. It encapsulates Van Dyck's genius. He takes a scene so casual, so realistic, a young family at home, and makes it resonate with symphonic grandeur. Nothing like it had been seen in England since an unknown artist painted this portrait for King Henry VIII, a picture that Van Dyck would have seen at Whitehall. Van Dyck takes informal majesty to the next level, showing the king as human and divine simultaneously. Van Dyck instinctively recognized Charles I's vision of himself and his kingship. The Great Peace was the first portrait Van Dyck painted when he returned to England in 1632, and promotion was swift. He was knighted in June and made principal painter in ordinary to the king. In August, he was paid 100 pounds by Privy Seal Warrant for one great piece of our royal self, consort and children. Given the success of this painting, it is no wonder that Charles I wanted to keep Van Dyck in England. His virtuosity found beauty in mundane sitters without losing their likeness. Though when Prince Rupert of the Rhine's sister, Sophia Electress of Hanover, eventually met Queen Henrietta Maria, she was disappointed that the Queen did not resemble the beautiful portraits of Van Dyck. <laughs> Instead, she was a much smaller woman, and Sophia remarked that she had crooked shoulders and teeth protruding from her mouth like guns from a fort. <laughs> One can imagine Sir Lionel Cust's surprise when he read the Chelsea Pensioners' Memorandum, in which Dias made three serious and substantial points. One, that the painting here at the Royal Hospital was the same size as that recorded in the catalogue of King Charles I's collection, made by the then surveyor of the King's pictures, Abraham van der Dort, when the great piece was hanging in the King's Long Gallery at Whitehall in 1639 nine foot by eight foot, whereas the painting at Windsor Castle was 12 foot by nine foot. Two, that the painting at Windsor Castle contained two dogs and Chelsea only one, and it was described as containing only one dog in the van der Dort catalogue. Three, 
that he had discovered that the Royal Hospital painting had been purchased between 1699 and 1702 by the commissioners from one Ireton for 47 pounds and five shillings. He identified the Ireton mentioned as Sir Henry Ireton, first equerry and gentleman of the horse to King William III, who was the son of Cromwell's general and son-in-law, also named Henry, and that the painting had likely been retained by the Cromwell family, who lived at Whitehall and Hampton Court after the death of Charles I, before <coughs> passing to Ireton, who sold it to the Royal Hospital in an act of royal restitution. Lionel Cust took the Chelsea pensioners' memorandum and proposal seriously. As surveyor of the King's pictures, he was doubtless a little concerned to read that the King's picture might only be a copy. Cust and Dias set out to investigate. They went to peer at the respective versions in Windsor Castle and here at the Royal Hospital. One doubtless dressed in morning coat and the other in his Royal Hospital blues or scarlet. At this stage, it's necessary to conjure a vision of the fog, soot, gaslight, and general murkiness that surrounded Edwardian London. It's to be remembered that both paintings would have been covered with thick, discolored, yellowed varnish, encrusted by centuries of smoke from coal fires and candles and chandeliers. In addition, both paintings had lived turbulent lives and had gone missing during the interregnum. Indeed, the version at Windsor Castle was in a dreadful condition. It had been restituted to Charles II by the bounty hunter Colonel Hawley in 1662, but then evacuated down the Thames to the Tower of London to keep it safe during the Great Fire in 1666. It then survived the Whitehall Fire of April the 9th, 1691, but was manhandled out of the palace in the process. It was later moved by William III to the new palace at Kensington, where he erected a new picture gallery. Unfortunately, Kensington Palace also caught fire at the end of 1691, and the great piece was again dragged from the wall to safety. In order to examine Corporal Dias's claims as thoroughly as possible, Lionel Cust commissioned the royal restorers, Messrs. Haynes and Sons, to examine both paintings. This they did, and they could determine that the great piece in the royal collection had been extended in height to match the size of the equestrian portrait of Charles I by Van Dyck when both were hung by William III in the new picture gallery at Kensington Palace. The dimensions of the great piece were not reduced when the painting was subsequently moved to Windsor Castle after the fire. Messrs. Haynes and Sons determined that its original height and width before its late 17th century extension did indeed match the size of the Whitehall painting recorded in van der Dort's catalog of the collection of Charles I. With regards to the missing dog in the Chelsea picture recorded by Dias and the missing dog in van der Dort's catalog, it was evident, and as you can see now, there actually is a second dog in the painting. But over the centuries, it had disappeared into the folds of Henrietta Maria's dress under the thick yellowed varnish. And that the Windsor painting had also been in similarly bad condition when van der Dorp wrote his catalogue in 1639, which probably explains the disappearing dog in the catalogue. Haynes and Sons also noted that the Chelsea painting bore the deliberate brushstrokes of a copyist rather than the vivacious brushstrokes of Van Dyck himself. It is to be much regretted that Charles Dias died on March the 30th, 1907, before his history of the Royal Hospital was finished. Lionel Cust wrote up the story of the great piece and published it in 1908 in the Burlington Magazine, of which he was editor, paying fulsome praise to the research of the Chelsea pensioner. Cust's conclusion was that the Windsor version was the original, and that the Chelsea version was a copy. 
possibly executed by one Remigius van Limput, an artist who had worked with Van Dyck as a payment by Charles I for a copy has survived. Perhaps the painting was commenced at an earlier date in the studio of Van Dyck. This conclusion matched the view of Sir George Scharf, Cust's predecessor as director of the National Portrait Gallery, who wrote to the governor of the Royal Hospital in 1871 that the large picture of Charles I and family is excellent and was doubtless done in Van Dyck's studio under his own inspection. By this stage of our research, we are intrigued by Charles Dias's thorough scholarship and Lionel Cust's equally scholarly responses. So Justin and I set out to re-examine some primary sources and see whether we could add anything to the research on these paintings. And did Van Dyck have anything to do with this painting? Did he paint it, as Dias claimed? Or, as mentioned earlier, is it only an important copy, as listed in the latest Van Dyck catalogue by the late Sir Oliver Miller? The first thing the Panel Paintings Project did, as befits its name, was to examine, with the kind permission of Her Majesty the Queen, Van Dyck's preliminary oil sketch on panel for the Great Peace, which was acquired by the Royal Collection in 2016. It was examined at Windsor in September 2018. The small grisaille measures 27 by 20 centimeters. There were not enough tree rings on the edge of the panel for us to find a date for the wood at this stage, but we hope to find one during the course of the project. But what was apparent is that Van Dyck's original thoughts were not only different in composition to the finished picture, which you can see in the placing of the children, but also of a different format to the completed picture. The oil sketch's rectangular format matches the original rectangular bolt of canvas in the Windsor Great Piece. It measures six foot nine in height and eight foot two in width. The painting was subsequently extended by Van Dyck. If there was a final technical piece of proof needed that the painting of the Great Piece at Windsor is Van Dyck's original, then this is it. We then re-examined the provenance of the Royal Hospital painting, hoping to discover which member of the Ireton family had sold it to the commissioners in 1700. There are only three possible Ayrtons at this date. First, Dias's candidate, the soldier, Henry Ayrton MP, King William III's equerry and gentleman of the horse, son of Cromwell's general. We were inclined to rule him out, as a lieutenant colonel of the second troop horse grenadiers with a fortune in East India Company stock, he would have been more likely to donate the painting to the Royal Hospital. Then there are Henry Ireton's cousins, the brothers Henry and German. Henry and German were the sons of John Ireton, General Ireton's brother, a thorough roundhead. John Ireton was Lord Mayor of London in 1658 for which he was knighted by Oliver Cromwell. He was lucky to survive the Restoration in 1660, but was in and out of the Tower of London, and could even have witnessed his brother's body being exhumed and beheaded at Tyburn, along with those of the other regicides, Oliver Cromwell and John Bradshaw. Like many roundhead grandees, John Ireton bought at the great auction of the King's goods held after Charles's execution in 1649. And he bought a remarkable object, the garter that the king had been wearing at his execution, with the motto of the Order of the Garter worked in 412 diamonds. Ayrton paid 205 pounds for the garter, more than was paid for the Leonardo Salvatore Mundi, sold in the same sale for 30 pounds and now the subject of some debate as to whether it is the painting sold by Christie's for 450 million pounds in 2017. Did John Ayrton also buy a copy of the great piece to go with this extraordinary trophy? He died in 1690, 
but was one of his sons, the Ayrton, who sold the painting to the commissioners of Chelsea Hospital 10 years later. The three commissioners were the men whose portraits you can see in this room, Sir Christopher Wren, Sir Stephen Fox, and the governor, the Earl of Ranelagh, a lovable man who, in his own words, had a generalist approach to bookkeeping. <laughs> and was subsequently, as is well known, expelled from Parliament for embezzling 900,000 pounds of public funds, a mind-boggling sum in the 18th century. <laughs> the brothers Henry and German Ireton had access to these circles through their cousin, the King's Equerry, and through their own work for the Treasury. Henry was collector of the excise in Kent from 1697 until the Lord Treasurer dispensed with his services on May 26, 1702, after a string of misfortunes. On one occasion, he was robbed by highwaymen. On another, he overcollected the tax. His brother, German Ayrton, had been one of His Majesty's agents for taxes since 1700 and was reappointed by Queen Anne on the same day that his brother was fired. German prospered and died a High Court judge in 1710. His picture collection was later sold at his chambers in Gray's Inn, but no catalogue survives. Either brother could have sold the painting to the Royal Hospital in 1700, but our burning question is whether there is any relation between Van Dyck and this painting, the version in the Royal Hospital, and therefore, by extension, between King Charles I and this painting. And we believe... The root of the answer lies in Antwerp, not in England. It lies in the 17th century Antwerp painter's studios, and most especially the studio practice of Peter Paul Rubens. And it was in Rubens's studio that Van Dyck worked as a young man and was described in a 1620 letter as Rubens' famous Alievo, his most gifted disciple. For a painting to leave Rubens' studio as a Rubens, there were at least four distinct categories. As Rubens explained in a letter to the English ambassador and collector Sir Dudley Carlton, dated April the 18th, 1618, at which time Van Dyck was working in Rubens' studio. The four categories of painting which could be called a Rubens were, according to the master himself, Firstly, a painting which was an original, the whole by my own hand. Secondly, an original by my hand, but with a part done by someone else, for example, an eagle by Snyders or a landscape by a master in that field. Thirdly, a painting done by one of my pupils, the whole, however, retouched by my hand. And fourthly, a painting begun by one of my pupils, a copy of one of my paintings, to be entirely retouched by my own hand, and by this means will pass as an original. So, only retouching by Rubens on a painting was required before it could leave his Antwerp studio, branded as a work of his own. And through his experience in Rubens' studio, this definition of an original also extends to Van Dyck in England. Did Charles I commission copies of the superb, groundbreaking, and well-received great piece from Van Dyck? The answer to that question is a resounding yes. We know that one copy was delivered by Van Dyck to Marie, Marie de Medici, Queen Henrietta Maria's mother, in 1633, when Marie de Medici was living in exile in Brussels. We also know that there were more copies in the royal collection made during Van Dyck's lifetime. The painter Remigius van Limput was paid 50 pounds by warrant in 1647 for a copy of the great piece in the royal collection. But there has historically been some doubt as to when the picture itself was painted. 
re-examining the original warrant in the British Library, the dating is clear. Limput was commissioned by the appointment of the Right Honourable Philip Earl of Pembroke for His Majesty. That's to say, by Pembroke in his role as Lord Chamberlain, a post from which he was dismissed in July 1641, five months before Van Dyck died. And the warrant states that Limput is to paint according to the copy of the great piece at Whitehall. So he wasn't copying Van Dyck's original painting, but another early copy of the Van Dyck in the Royal Collection. This tallies with the 1649 inventories of King Charles I's goods taken after his execution, which, in addition to Van Dyck's original, include a copy of the great piece of Van Dyck at Whitehall. Both sold are sold for 60 pounds to Emmanuel de Critz, who also bought the original version for 150 pounds. And a third picture, the king, queen, prince, and princess after Van Dyck at Hampton Court, valued at 30 pounds. No buyer is listed for the Hampton Court copy. So we have evidence of several early copies hanging in the royal palaces and also sent as gifts to close royal relations. Could the painting behind me be one of those commissioned by Charles I and completed in Van Dyck's studio, as Lionel Cuss thought, and which, under Flemish studio practices, would have left the studio as a painting by Anthony Van Dyck if the master had retouched it? It depends on whether there is retouching or intervention in the painting by Van Dyck himself. And the answer to the list lies only in a visual examination of the painting. And we are very grateful for the generous assistance of the painting conservator Simon Gillespie, who many of you might know from the popular art history programs Fake and Fortune and Britain's Lost Masterpieces, and who has got up close and personal with many Van Dyck paintings over the course of his career. Given that this painting is over 400 years old, it has survived remarkably well. The darker red lacquer pigment used for shadowing the red vermilion of the tablecloth to the left and of the chairs for the monarch and his queen is well preserved, although this was one of the most fragile pigments of the time. On the other hand, faces of the queen and her daughter to the right have suffered by wear, possibly over cleaning, and subsequently been overpainted by a less subtle hand than that of a Flemish master. Therefore, we need to look at the other passages of the painting to permit a fair judgment of the picture's real quality. In contrast to the unsubtle overpainting are the vivid brushstrokes of Henrietta Maria's yellow dress, where the shadows are suggested by touches of contrasting blue-gray. And in the painting of the king's silk linings and stockings, where the line of the right leg is defined by a masterly and dashing stroke of dark red. And the painting of other particular passages, notably the king's head and the ruff, is superb. 90% quality in Simon's words. Top-notch studio of Van Dyck. Moreover, the subtle strengthening of the contours of the two dogs points to a hand which was well acquainted with Van Dyck's painting practices. For these reasons, the Chelsea painting has therefore justly been judged one of the best early versions of the great piece. But, as you will see when you look closely at the picture after this talk, and Simon has kindly agreed to focus his torch on the pertinent passages, the painting consistently shows delicate highlights where the light touches the protruding passages of figures and objects. Strokes like this make the picture three-dimensional. Some of these added highlights are tiny but telling. The highlights on the bridge of the king's nose and at the right contour of his left eye are fluid, rhythmic, and outstanding, as are the brush strokes which structure the monarch's right leg, the dashing highlights of the queen's drapery, and on the dogs. So, where does this leave us at the end of the trail begun by the Chelsea pensioner, Corporal Charles Dias, and followed by the surveyor of the King's pictures, Sir Lionel Cust, over a hundred years ago. We have ascertained that the painting in the Royal Collection at Windsor 
is Van Dyck's original. But is this painting of the great piece at the Royal Hospital a Van Dyck or not a Van Dyck? The answer is yes. In 17th century terms, this is a Van Dyck. This painting, probably commissioned by Charles I to hang in a royal palace or to be given as a gift, would have left Anthony Van Dyck's studio in Blackfriars, mainly produced by an assistant, but retouched and finished by the master himself as a Van Dyck. Thank you very much. Nice way to have the paint, um, and that, that I would say is being finished off by Van Dyke. The similarly, you can actually see the little highlights along the uh, of the um, of the white. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and he was also very confused. He never. He wasn't very good at 